Hey guys, welcome to Only Us. I'm Nicole Payson. I'm Dalila Ali Raja. Hey, hey, hey. Hey. <laughs> uh, we are dear friends. You probably, m many of you probably know this as we've been in uh, a few videos together. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we like to talk to yes. each other and yes. also include you in the conversation. <laughs> um, so I figured this was a good opportunity. I knew I wanted to bring you on the show anyway. Like for, I mean, for many different reasons and uh, we could talk about all the things under the sun all day. Yes. 20 million of them. That's really true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but specifically, uh, I'm doing my series of videos this month on Black History Month, as you guys know, if you've been following. And so I wanted to have Dalila on because she's just so wonderfully articulate and... Mm -hmm feelingful and spiritual Beautiful. and I admire the crap out of you. So <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> That's why I want to have you on and ask you questions. <laughs> um and I guess like okay, so I'm just gonna fire away. Okay. Yeah. So um first as we're going into Black History Month, I I always or as we are in the thick of it now, um I can't help but stop and be like, okay how many, like, black historical figures can a lot of white people even name? Like, I feel like we get inundated with, with, like, MLK, amazing, not that, and now, of course, Obama, and, like, Harriet Tubman, and, you know, Rosa Parks, and we have, like, these names that float around, but then it's, like, crickets, in a it's way. It's usually the, the people who are more comfortable for white America to digest. They feel safer. Oh. and non-threatening, which is the reason why they're the ones that are pulled out. And they don't even pull out usually the most, like, MLK actually had some really awesome, very radical speeches that I think we'll never show or play or put excerpts from because they don't want people to know that, like, towards the end of his life and, like, towards the end of Malcolm X's life, actually their, their ways of going came closer together than they were farther apart. Mm -hmm. um, and Malcolm X is very, to most people, or, like, the Black Panthers, for instance, like... <sighs> A lot of the people that people tout as um, being very radical, they like miss the holistic part of their the things that they did. Like, mm -hmm. it's it's interesting. I saw like something this morning, and this is also Black Panther Appreciation Month because Black Panther comes out this month. Oh my god! Yes, so here for it. I tell you, I'm so here for it. I'm so here for it. I'm so here for it. I am so here for it. That's I a mean, very big side note. However, here for it. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> agreed. I am too. But there was. This crazy mean that this that this um probably I don't I can't even call him very well meaning sorry I can't but this gentleman who made this meme about like if we made a, a movie about the KKK and something like this whole thing and I just looked what? at it like, like Could, wait comparing what? the Black Panthers to the KKK yeah and the Black Panther movie to the KKK which shows how much he knows about black history and Marvel Universe what yeah, is also he like, with? and also like what like, I mean, what? Ignorant on all the levels. Like, on every <laughs> single level possible. But I was like, if you're saying this, you don't even know, like, the, the Black Panthers started the, the lunch programs, the free lunch programs and the breakfast programs for kids in the schools. Most of why they started was because our communities were not being cared for by a lot of the government programs. They're like, well, if nobody else is going to do it, we're going to do it. Yeah. All that stuff about, although this quickest way to get um, gun control laws, like, they really took got their arms, followed all the laws, and did a march with open carry when California used to have open carry laws. You want to know how quick they changed their laws? So California, that's why California doesn't have open carry laws now, is because they did a march with them, peaceful, peaceful march, open carry, and legislators changed their laws so quick, so quick. But like people see those images and they automatically say like they're going to kill people, they're going to shoot, like, but they were very peacefully, like they're like, we're taking care of our rights. They were educating people about their rights so that they yeah. know when they were detained by police or when they were pulled over what their rights were. That was very uncomfortable, especially during that time. And the government took it on themselves, actually, a lot of the clan, like the CIA, all that, to discredit them, to make them be seen as terrorist organizations. It's a part of the reason why they made cannabis illegal. Like, there's so many things that are connected in that come out of, like, just miseducation mm -hmm. of people about our historical figures because any, those feel less safe. Like, people that are educating black people about our rights or making sure all of our children are fed like that's which is horrible but true that that's scary to people like a part of our America was built on colonialism yeah so the reality is it's built on structures of racism 
And I think that that's why you hear so much people reacting, like when people start talking about equality or people being equal, <laughs> as it being unpatriotic. They're so used to America's fundamentals being racist that when it really becomes equal or people really feel equal or they really start talking about equality, they it, it becomes a thing like, oh, you're going against America. Mm, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. No, we're not. But did, there was like a whole um, T-Mobile ad that just got all this pushback. Oh, no, I know. I saw that. It's, it's literally like seven or eight infants Babies. of different colors. Some of them are just racially ambiguous, I'm sure, on purpose. And there's like one or two that you can tell are, are children of color, maybe. Um, and it says we are all equal. Oh yeah, and people were like, I'm, I'm, I'm dropping you as a carrier. I and saw this. And this is unpatriotic. And I'm tired of this liberal. How did equality become only a liberal tenant? No, like, I, I, I completely. It's insane. But, but so all that's to say, I think that that's the reason why there's so many people that you only see them mm -hmm. because they're easier to make their safe. They're like, mm -hmm. this is the way that you should do things. Mm -hmm. This is the way you black people should behave. Don't get too unruly. Mm -hmm. Don't get too uppity. Stay in your lane. And then everybody will tout you forever. It, even though obviously MLK was still assassinated. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, but yeah. it's like they still pull him out. But like, if you look at even, like Bayard Rustin is is the one who like introduced MLK. Him and Coretta Scott King introduced um, MLK to the teachings of like Gandhi and the non-violent movement, all that stuff. But Bayard Rustin was an out gay man, and they didn't want him at the forefront because they were like it would cause a problem with them trying to reach public. And so they made MLK the face, even though he's the one who was like the main like anchor of the organizing of a lot of the marches that they did. Yeah. Um, and so people just don't know, or like Barbara Jordan, like there's there's these people that, that people just don't know about, even from back then in the civil rights movement. And then like other stuff like, did you know that a black person invented caller ID? No. I didn't either until we started <laughs> doing those videos. Black person invented caller ID. Amazing. And a black, a black woman invented the home alarm system too. Really? Uh -huh. Thank you. To that lady. Yeah, there's like there's a whole bunch of like things that that we are responsible for that have just kind of gotten like washed out of history and not like lifted up. Yeah, and not really celebrated and recognized. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think, I think people have to take it on themselves though to take time to learn because they know yeah. that they're they know that. Well, I guess a lot of people don't know. If you don't know we are taken out of a lot of the history. There's a lot of stuff that we did, and a lot of actually other people of color, honestly, and traditionally underrepresented groups that did a lot to contribute to America and the world. Looking it up would be helpful because you'll probably find way more than we could ever say here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh yes, for sure. <laughs> well, and on that note, too, um, well, it, like, this month is great in the sense that, like, a lot of the media outlets are like, here's a list of books that you should read mm -hmm. that you wouldn't normally find in mm -hmm. your path. And, like, it's actually relatively easy to find that stuff, guys. The one thing that I found difficult as I was researching um, for all of this was, like, I really wanted to know more uh, queer black historical mm -hmm. figures. Mm -hmm. And I found a few, but almost no one that I didn't know about already. Like, and that mm -hmm. is a whole, I know, a separate struggle. Yeah, well, intersectionality is always a thing of anyway, course. because when you have multiple um, identifying monikers that, that kind of put you in these different lanes, Yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes with that anyway. And yeah. I think in particular, actually, for black culture, and it's interesting, because I talked to like my mother, my grandfather was a Baptist minister in the Deep South. Mm -hmm. Um, but was also a biblical theologian and, and knew Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew, translated old versions of the Bible. So he had kind of a different take on a lot of it. So he didn't really, like, talk about the horrors of homosexuality. Like, he never brought that. Like, that was nothing that was ever a part of his church. There was a lesbian couple that lived on their street that they knew were lesbians, but nobody really talked about it, which isn't a, a thing in that, that, that kind of culture. You just didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. But they were also treated equally with everybody in the community. The kids went... To their house like they did to everybody else's house they baked for everybody they did you know like they weren't treated any differently mm -hmm. there was a you know a young gay man that worked for my grandfather in his parsonage and everybody just knew he was queer i mean you just knew but like you didn't talk about it right 
But my mother, and, and if you look it up in history too, besides my mother sharing this with me, but just looking it up, before um, desegregation actually, black communities were more integrated with each other So because everybody had to take care of each other. So the queer community was not as ostracized then. We just took care of each other. People were more comfortable mm -hmm. being out. You didn't like talk about it, but you were just a lot of times who you were. Mm -hmm. But when desegregation happened, people needed to present an image for white people because it was almost like proving we're worthy of being equal because it was such a struggle. So it was like needing to permit, per, like present this perfect image. Same reason like Rosa Parks, for instance, was not the first person to refuse to get out of her seat. Um, the first young woman who they, and she wasn't the first either. My uncle refused to get out of the seat and thank God did not get lynched because he was just kind of that dude that sometimes did stuff like that. And my other uncle would be like, oh Lord Jesus, you're going to get us killed. But he just was that dude who could kind of sometimes get away with that stuff even though a lot of people really didn't and, and were murdered. Um, but there was a young woman who was, she was pregnant out of wedlock and she did the same thing and w would have had a valid case, but they were like, we don't want to present an image of a young and unwed, unwed teen of course. as the image for this movement. So they waited till an older, you know, more staunch, more, you know, polished image showed up for the marketing basically. Mm -hmm. But it, it was like that then became a part of how people needed to walk through the world. Mm -hmm. um, partially for safety um, and and for trying to build from something where up through oppression trying to find a way to equality like that thing about most people of color you hear almost like you get that speech you got to work twice as hard to get half as much and that's just what you do you have to be better than the best you that's just what it is because people you don't have that unearned privilege well I mean look at President Obama I, I like the, the man, insane. I mean, agree or disagree with his policies, whatever, that's that's your choice. But, like, the man as a man and as the, the family are beyond reproach. I mean, in in every conceivable way. I, I, it, it feels... And he's I can't imagine... Brilliant. And I can imagine the pressure to maintain that and then still to be followed by this utter buffoon who is just like a, a complete moral clusterfuck. Like I, I Which I, tells you how much people really, really, really need to hold on to their privilege. Oh yeah. Like they, yeah. they yeah. needed mm -hmm. something to reinstate what felt like a foundation of the world changing, which is like, you know, it's like when you get when you get used to, I forget, there's this great quote that I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's something along the lines like, when you get used to, um, when you get used to privilege, like having a certain amount of privilege, mm -hmm. a certain amount of like, then like when somebody becomes equal, it somehow feels like something's being taken away from you or like you're losing something. For sure. Um, and then I think it calls into question for a lot of people like, well, if I really acknowledge that there's this unearned privilege, then maybe I wasn't the best for that job. Mm -hmm. Maybe I wasn't really the best at that thing or for that position, or maybe I didn't do as good on that thing as I thought I did, um, which is really uncomfortable for people to yeah. acknowledge to themselves. It's hard, and so a lot of them would rather just believe that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Well, and it also calls into question, you know, like background and identity, and when something comes up against the belief that, like, you're a fundamentally good person or you come from fundamentally good stock or I mean I can say like being from the Northeast mm -hmm. there are a lot of Northeastern white people would like to believe that they were on the right side of history because they're Northeastern mm -hmm. and meanwhile like there were slaves in the North guys like there like yeah. it wasn't as prevalent but it doesn't mean that there wasn't slavery and like we we honestly in the Northeast were almost raised to believe that like the north wasn't racist like which the, is the a north whole wasn't racist, other it's amazing which, it's like but but that's the thing and then when when then people come up against this like oh no no guys like that's not actually how it was or is there is this cognitive dissonance that goes mm -hmm. like well this i saw myself as the good guy so yeah. how can i not be the good guy yeah. you know and uh, uh, the friend of mine the, the history teacher that i spoke to um mm -hmm. uh who deals a lot with these subjects with kids and figuring out how to present it in a way that's palatable but also very truthful. Mm -hmm. um, he said, first of all, you know, if you lay out kind of both sides, mm -hmm. kids find truth. Like, the mm -hmm. truth will rise to the top and, like, you have to trust that they're going to, but you have to present them with the information, mm -hmm. all of it, 
Mm -hmm. um, and let them make that choice for themselves. Um, but yeah, he, he, um, what did he say about that? He said, oh yeah, that it's not about teaching the kids like, you know, be ashamed of like where you've come from and who you are and like what your people did or whatever, but it, it's saying taking ownership of it. He's like, mm -hmm. because if you can't, if they can't take ownership, if like we can't take ownership of the fact that we have been the beneficiaries of this system and then understand that we cannot have honest discourse about it and we cannot change anything. Yeah. I had a great um, teacher when I was in, well, he had, funny enough, he actually wasn't my direct teacher, but he was one of the teachers in our school and he was, I always look like a hippie. So, I love Mr. Christensen. He had like seriously like Jesus linked hair. Yes. Always wore like vests and like bell bottoms. <laughs> but like like in in the recent era was still wearing <laughs> yeah. his bell bottoms and his vest, which is awesome. But he taught all of his students every year. He's like, We are the beneficiaries mm -hmm. of this system and as beneficiaries of the privilege, it is our responsibility to create change. Yes. He's like, if you are benefiting from it, you can say whatever you want, you can say whatever you feel about what you're doing in your life now, but even if in this lifetime you genuinely feel like you're not getting a direct benefit or taking it, you are because of the mm -hmm. system. And because you are, you have to change it because the people who are receiving the privileges have to be the ones to make the change. Absolutely. Um, because you have to be willing to see power. And almost nobody sees power without a fight. Yeah. Like people have to be willing to shift that paradigm and be willing to not only give it freely but fight for it. Absolutely. And isn't that also so in line with like the things that people tout as being patriotic? You know, yeah. like going back to this idea that like if if we're really going to exist here in America on, with the belief that you know freedom and justice for all and that equality is like at the you know f the foundation of our country in some mm -hmm. way which a lot of people like to believe then uh, it is your patriotic duty to fight for your fellow citizens and make things better for them. Yeah, which is what's, in, like, our country, obviously, like I said, was founded on racism, but I think the idea of America at its core, mm -hmm. um, which it's an idea, it's an idea. Yeah. And it's an unrealized idea. It hasn't, it has yeah. not, it has yes. not yet been realized. Yes. Um, it's a goal that the forefathers were striving for and failing miserably at because they were making those rules while slaves, mm -hmm. while some of them were literally wh raping their slaves, um, mm -hmm. while writing these things about freedom and justice for all and that all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. um, and those ideals, I think, are good ones. I think the idea is a fantastic idea. Sure. I think the ideas of equality and justice and, and, and the things that um, were coming through them because I do feel like it's coming through them at the time because it clearly was so not in alignment with some of the things that were happening mm -hmm. that those ideas that were coming through them are awesome yeah the implementation of them wonky <laughs> to say the least understatement of the century <laughs> yeah um but I still think it's an idea that we can strive for and that is yeah. the reason why it continues to expand and expand and include more people and exclude yes. include more things in it and, and it help people realizing that it, it it requires a lot like I would even say like for instance I am a black queer woman in America there's a lot of things where I do not have privilege but there are places where I do have privilege like I my family is very educated and always have been which we have privilege of education and they weren't like a very wealthy generational wealth family we were my like I said my grandfather was a minister they lived in a parsonage and didn't get their Christmas tree until Christmas Eve because they couldn't afford to buy one they had to take the one that was in the church and then move it to the house on Christmas Eve so that they had something to wake up to on Christmas morning but and this is again like when my great 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 grandmother I forget how many greats it is I would have to look at a piece of paper however <laughs> whoever the the man who owned her which we're pretty sure was the governor of Georgia but we're not sure when slavery was ended he kept her and took care like kept taking care of her and my great grandfather mm -hmm. and made sure he was educated like started an entire institution to educate him so and and other children that were of mixed race that were that fed directly into Spelman and Morehouse so like pretty much right from the end of slavery like he was getting an education became the principal of this institution then my grandfather was like one of a handful of black PhDs in the South in the deep south in the 1950s all of those things set me up to have a privilege of education that makes it like people in my family are probably more likely to go to college than people who don't have that like and how many people coming out of slavery 
had their family going directly into college so that that, that generational educational like underpinning of found, was there for them, mm-hmm. for them to kind of move up on, right? There's privilege in that, right? So for me, I think it's like, I out and, and like as a woman, I'm a woman who happens to be outspoken and was really encouraged to do that by my family. There are a lot of women that I know did, were not taught that. I think that like there's like we're we're looking at and and not that because I fall into the Me Too category too, just like pretty much literally every woman that I know. Yeah. Um, but I was having a conversation the other day where this woman was talking about well I don't want to fall into victimhood and I don't want to, like all these things about and I was like no 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 we're sitting in this space and that we can even have this conversation is a privilege. We're women that have a different voice than some other women. And mm-hmm. I feel like it's our responsibility to speak up and help support those women who didn't feel like they had a voice or didn't have the, the privilege that get granted them the, the inner space to be able to speak at the time when something happened. That's our, I feel like that's our responsibility. Yeah. Just like there's sometimes like I, I can, I think there's a lot of times, not all the time, cause sometimes I'm, it, I'm up to my neck in it too, but like conversations about racism or educating people, um, Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I feel like I have more patience than some other people are capable of. I feel like you as do. long as I... <laughs> you do. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, But, like, I don't blame people for not having patience. Yes. Like, like, it's... I... That is a really big thing. And that is something that, like, in the first video in this series, uh, I talked about that educating yourself. Yeah. Taking that on because it is not someone else's responsibility to educate you, yeah. especially in the age of information. It is well, like this stuff is so re- readily available. I mean, and I think like, like actually, this is another question I wanted to ask. I mean, for I think the one thing that people find maybe more than anything where it's like, oh, I want to ask a question and I don't know how to ask a question is about allyship, mm-hmm. like and saying, you know beyond some of the obvious things like what is it that how can I be a better ally basically you know that and like I don't know is that a fair question to ask or is that one of those like I think kicks back to like go do your research I think there's some of us go to your research but the reality is that that the answer to that question is going to be different for different people sure so the reality is people can do their best yeah and they still may somebody may just be tired of being tired like we spend a lot of time explaining this stuff so it's like and and that's the reality um i think the things that get most frustrating for me in that is somebody like if there is a large group of actually any group that's traditionally underrepresented but since we're talking about black history month of black people that are for instance offended by something like for instance that h&m shirt or something and Mm -hmm. and what you're saying is like that is not offensive did it And, and going through this whole thing about why it doesn't matter if there's a large group and you don't get it, take the time to understand it. Mm-hmm. Don't dismiss why people... If there's that many people that are upset, there's probably a reason. Yeah. There's something underneath it that you don't know. There's some aspect of this that you don't understand or get the layers of. Like that. There's mm-hmm. that whole thing that happened with Old Navy where there's like a guy oh God, who yeah. had on like this jacket, a jacket purchased from Old Navy and given to him as a gift. And he was in there shopping. And, like, three different people, including the manager, were like, are you going to pay for that jacket? He's like, I already bought this jacket. Um, well, we need to scan it, to t- which you can't even tell when you scan it. Like, it's all these things that were basically accusing him of stealing, right? We People don't, like... And there's people who are like, well, that doesn't seem like... An, they weren't accusing him, and they shouldn't have been doxing. And they're defending the salespeople. For people calling the salespeople out online, it's like... Do you understand how many times a day this happens to people and nothing gets done to anybody? I like, I don't know a single, a single black man and several black women who have not been pulled over for driving while black. Not one. The only time that I have been screened going into LAX was when my boyfriend at the time, who was black, was driving me. The only time ever. Like, <laughs> like, I, like, come on. Yeah, it's... <laughs> anyway. Yeah, no, but that's, 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 like, people don't get, like, how long it's been happening and how long we've been aware. Because, like, it's interesting, like, there's a... People are like, all of a sudden, these police shootings are... You know, it's like, you don't get it. Mm-hmm. People have been murdering us at enormously high rates, including police officers, for a very, very long time. 
it's not that it's happening more. It's that there's more cameras, so you're seeing it more. Mm -hmm. And that's about all of this stuff, which I think is opening people's eyes because then they're able to look at it themselves. But it's still, the first question people usually ask is, well, what did they do? Instead of saying, it doesn't really matter because if you look at this across the board, if the person's skin color would be different, would this have gone down this way? Mm -hmm. No matter what they did. Mm -hmm. Like there's been like white men literally waving guns at the police that have been taken into custody. They put a bulletproof vest on Dylan Booth and then took him to Burger King before they took him to jail. Knowing he'd killed nine people. Trayvon Martin, like the, the list of like, the list is insane of how many young black men who are unarmed have been shot in the back. Yeah. And it's like an irrational fear on your part is not an excuse for murder. No, absolutely. But, but, but again, that it's goes... hard for people to see it though, because they have that. Yes. Well, and this goes back again to that, like cognitive dissonance, right? Yeah. Too, because like. You know, people, certain officers in those situations will go like, well, but I'm not racist, but I'm not, well, like, if you don't take that time to actually come up against your own cognitive dissonance about something where it says, hi, like, you have inherited a system in which you benefit, and you have been taught in a way that allows you to see yourself separately from these people, and unless mm -hmm. you admit and own that, we're not saying you're a bad person, but if you don't admit and own that you can't honestly look at that in yourself challenge it and avoid making a snap judgment like that it's also like people are trained to fear black men and they're trained to see little boys as men instead of as little boys mm -hmm. so th there's like a dissonance in that too yes. that people aren't acknowledging mm -hmm. um and that's a part of like hmm. like that's it's it's like the ability, which I think that that's actually the biggest thing in allyship is like it, acknowledging that this stuff is there, acknowledging unconscious bias. Like I know that like, I'm sure that I wrote you about this at the time, but when you did that whole video where like you were super mm -hmm. transparent and you were like acknowledging, but like I cried when I read it and it was such, it was like a salve to the inside. It was like a deep breath and like, I, I, I can't even describe what it was to hear someone that I loved and care about actually own that because there's so much time where we have people we love and we feel safe with that are unwilling to acknowledge or admit that. And so we get hurt over and over again too by people that we've let into places that are um, um, sacred or loving for us. And so it's hard that, and that also gets in the way of creating community, but it's because people aren't acknowledging like this overall thing. And like, and I have, I, I'm blessed. I have several friends like that. My, my, um, my friend Amanda Di Divert. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so like she said, like I'll get into these things because like I said, I'm more patient than a lot. So I'll end up getting into these long things on Facebook trying to explain to people. And like I remember this one that she's like, let me step in here. She shouldn't have to explain to you. So I'm as a white person going to take over <laughs> and try and help you with this so that she doesn't get exhausted by this conversation. But I didn't have to like ask for that. Like she's just like, let me take over this and help you to understand and take responsibility as, as a fellow white person awesome. for my fellow white person of trying to get you to comprehend what's going on here that you're missing. That's allyship. Do you know what I'm saying? Like those moments, educating yourself and then being willing to educate your brothers and sisters when you hear them saying something mm -hmm. that's like not okay or that they aren't getting something, like doing the research to really get the underlying things about it. Like, I, and I've been to like trainings and leadership trainings where they talk and one of the women, she's like, People called her out in the same way. Like, she didn't have a person like me when she was trying to get to know this stuff back in, like, the 60s and the 70s. And they're like, this is not our responsibility. There's books and tons of workshops you can go to. Go to one of them. Mm -hmm. Go to one. Yeah. And But she did. And so, and then, she, you know, and then she started working with them and then teaching them to people, too. Because she's like, we need to take responsibility for our own, like, those of us mm -hmm. that are, are willing, able, and can learn to take on responsibility for having those conversations about what the problem is with a lot of this stuff. Yeah. You know, it's yes. because it's, it, the, the other thing is somebody who has had that cognitive dif dissonance is going to be able to more powerfully shed light to someone who's having it than I ever could. And they'll totally. be able to hear you better yeah. than they can hear me. So like the more people that are willing to take that on and really educate themselves, like really do the things, learn the things, learn the, 
the, the patterns and the stuff that's going on underneath and have those conversations, the ripples will be more exponential than you can ever imagine. Absolutely. Well, someone's sitting there and saying, like, I get you. I'm not villainizing you for thinking this way or acting this way. What I'm telling you is that, like, I'm on the other side of it now, and let's talk because, mm -hmm. like, I get you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's it's necessary. Like, mm -hmm. We absolutely have to do that within our own mm -hmm. white communities. I mean, also for people out there who are wondering what else you can do, there's also white people for black lives. Like, if you mm -hmm. do a little... A little bit of digging online. Look mm -hmm. up white people for black lives in your city or town mm -hmm. or whatever. And there are a lot of meetings where you can go and you can have other white people educate you in all of this and feel like you know you can approach a conversation with respect and with education and be supportive and not be talking all the time <laughs> doing more listening doing you know I mean there are places where people want to share this information you mm -hmm. know where it's not being put on the black community to do the education yeah. like it does not take that much yeah. to seek that out and I think there's also um, the other you were asking for find places of forgiveness in those moments of frustration because I think mm -hmm. that there's also people who are genuinely wanting to help and not getting how long and how exhausting the experience of living as a black person in America is. Sure. So when they're making their first overture to try and have this conversation, you have no, I don't think it's possible to comprehend how much is on the other side of all of that for the person you're approaching. So if they aren't as graceful or as easy, it's just like, oh my God, like it's, there's so much already on the person so like finding your way to forgiveness or grace and understanding how much like if you like I don't even know how like there's some films that I know that like open people's eyes I, that's a part of why I'm a storyteller is like right like if you just even get a fraction of what it is by watching just even some of the films like you know the, you know the birth of a nation mm -hmm. or 12 years a slave like those ones that actually dig a little bit deeper into some more of the atrocities, and then you imagine that that was just skimming the surface mm -hmm. of what was done to people for generations, and then in some places is still showing up, honestly, yeah, um, in different ways. Um, you start to get a weight, and I know it's hard because people feel guilt and they feel shame, and the reality is that there are things that most of the ancestors, and, and the thing is often they're shared ancestors because the women were raped so often, like we have shared answer, ancestors as well. Yeah. But that um, owning, owning that as something that's not just a guilt that weighs you down, but that's a motivator to create change. Yes. Like, yes. It, 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 take it on so that it doesn't become a weight that's just like, oh my God, I, I have to be ashamed for the rest of my life, say that this is then that feeling, that yucky feeling inside, be like, but I can do something about this now. I can start to change the system. I can educate myself. Mm -hmm. I, I, can, I can place myself in conversations where I'm willing to own that and, and talk about the things and not try and play devil's advocate to everything, which I get a lot of people, you know, like, why do you play the race card? Why do you say it's always about that? Yeah. And the reality is, really, it is a lot more often than you think actually about that. Yeah. It's unfortunate that that's true, but it really is. It's, it's, there's often yeah. that things are about race when people really want to pretend like they're not. Well, I mean, a lot of people want to be in, like, a post-racial society. And, like, what what is that, even? How is that, like, what? I mean, and if we don't draw attention to this, then it just continues to be glossed over. And we continue to just say, well, you know, it's like... Like, cops do things in situations, and it's just intense, and that could have been a white guy. No, it couldn't. Okay, because... Also, this just happened, so I'm like, I have to say this. The freaking rioting after the Super Bowl with white people in the streets in Philadelphia destroying, destroying property. And this massive. cops just being like, oh, it's going to be a long night. Versus like, I mean, just. And they arrested 17 Black Lives Matter protesters of the Super Bowl. And only three of the people actually destroying property. And the Black Lives Matter people were protesting peacefully. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? Like, it's so it's like how how can you possibly be accused of pulling a race card in that situation? I mean, that is that is just so obvious that like 
But people, they're like, they're celebrating. It's revelry. They're just out of, you know, it's, um... Well, it's much more comfortable to think about it that way. Sure. Yeah, I, uh, I... For some people. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's more comfortable for a, a lot of people because it's status quo. Yeah. And it requires a lot to change a system. Yeah. And, and it does have people have to give up something. Yeah. And which is the thing, like, it's... Like, which I know Louis C.K. is really in the doghouse because of all the stuff with the sexual harassment, but I have to say, I still... The story that he told about, like, his kid and, like, about slavery and, and like, about... I don't know. It's actually great. Like, again, I, I know that I know, he's really I, in a horrible I place. I feel the same I have way a, about Louis I have a total problem with everything he did. I'm not saying this. It's still a great story where he's talking about, like, his daughter was, like, upset about some medicine. She's like, he's like, you can't... He's like, you're a little white girl in America. You don't get to be upset about bubblegum antibiotics. There's kids making t-shirts your age that you have on. Like, you don't get to, like, you don't get to do like that. And he's like, you know, and I get it. And he was talking about, like, I'm about black people and white people in America. And he's like, and I'm not saying that black, white people have it easier than, I mean, white people have it easier than black people in America, but, but, but white people have it easier than black people in America. <laughs> he's, he's like, yeah. he's like, but you know, it's hard for white people too. He said, because, you know, he's like, well, and he goes through, he's like, slavery was just, like, everybody keeps making it 400. He's like, it was like 150 years ago. That's like somebody's grandma like lived a life, died, and then lived it again. That's like just like two grandmas, and you're right back at slavery. Like there's people who were owned, like other people owned them. And then that doesn't even include how many years we were into Jim Crow before we got to the 60s. It just hasn't been that long. It just had. He said, but you know, he's like, white people are going through stuff too because, you know, they lost their slaves. <laughs> But the thing that's crazy, like, but, people, like, but yeah. it's true, but it's true. Like, and I get that, like, and I, I have all of my black iron on my things, but the reality is people don't like to talk about that psychology because it's uncomfortable for everybody yeah, involved. But the reality is that there is a whole set of generations and generations of people that were raised in this authoritarian society in the South that they were taught from the time they were born for a very long time that I am less of a human than they are, that they are actually even, even the most benevolent of them were taught that they were doing me a favor because I would be a heathen in the streets and 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 worse if I were not cared for by the bigger, better, whiter, um, more genteel race and that they were doing things to help us and that this was what we were doing in return and that we'd own them and that we would not be here without them, like all of that. That's what they were taught. And then all of a sudden one day people start saying that's wrong. And they're like, this can't be wrong. This is what I've lived on. And this has been my life and my way of being and my family's life for hundreds of years. And nobody knows what to do with all that stuff underneath it because that's who they were. That was what they were taught is right. Mm -hmm. So it was like an entire paradigm shift for them within a matter of, from their ideas, a matter of years. And then they found a way to get it back briefly because, honey, they, they, in Reconstruction, like half the cent, like when things were actually equal and the federal government was actually keeping the laws intact, half the Senate was was black at that time, and then I didn't know that. Girl, girl yes, you should watch. Rachel Maddow has a great um, thing on it. We love Rachel. She breaks it down. I learned some stuff that I didn't even know. That you know the only reason. So they sent the National Guard to keep things intact, and they and they did. And what started happening is all the black people were the skilled labor other than the people who had owned slaves who had just lost all their money and all their crops and all their slaves. So the only people that were able to, like, like the carpetbaggers, the people, the blacksmiths, all that stuff were black people. So they, they were the only ones who could do most of the job. So most of the white American, they, they didn't have any way to make any money. And they lost a war, and they were dealing with all this stuff. They were, they, people were allowed to vote. The National Guard was there to enforce that. So it actually was even. So you got, like, again, half the, almost half the Senate was black people. By the time it rolled around to the next election, um, this is what's crazy. This is the only other time where by this much of a margin, the president with uh, the popular vote and the electoral vote, like he lost, whoever became president, and don't forgive me, watch the Rachel bit because I don't remember the name of the president, sorry. Um, but he lost the electoral vote and the popular vote. And he was on the side that was um, the abolitionist side. And the side that was pro-slavery was like, hey, we will give you guys the presidency if when you get it, you pull the National Guard out of the South. <sighs> and they agreed. And this was after all the votes were cast, everything. 
So that side took the presidency, took the National Guard out, and all that was when that huge rising of the KKK happened. When by and then by the next election they put in all the the Jim Crow laws, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the Senate went back to being completely white, mm-hmm. and the KKK was lynching people all over the place to get the racial disparity back in place. And yeah, and, back and of place. course we don't hear this because history is politicized, and it would not be good for the liberal political party to uh, to know that this is our history. <laughs> like, I mean, no, no, yeah. I mean, really, like the, it, it does. It, and actually, and it was switched then because the Republicans were actually the ones, the ones, abol- yeah, abolitionists so. at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like it's a mess, and I, you know, it's interesting because. In, in having researched this a little, um, uh, going back to Isabel Wil- Wilkerson, she talks about how you know, slavery spanned 12 generations of people. So 12 generations within a family. And then she talks about how, you know, when you go to the doctor, they ask for at least two generations of history back to diagnose what's happening with you. And she's like, wouldn't that make sense to apply that then to people's socioeconomic situation to the the climate in this country at this time Mm -hmm. like this is not that long ago Mm -hmm. and like history carries that way and on the flip side of it you have people that were coming up from slave owners Mm -hmm. and that's only a couple generations since then and that all that that was taught and all that that was lost is in their blood Mm -hmm. and in their teachings yeah and like to think that somehow we've I, I don't know like I seriously until the age of 15 was brought up to believe that like racism ended it with the civil rights movement like that's like wow like that's with, fascinating now not it's not like I didn't know that things did that things happen but it, it was somewhere else it was yeah. like oh people still get called bad names in the south yeah People stood like it was. Yeah, the first time I was called very in, girl. The first time I was called the N word was here in California, on in right outside of L A. Well, and, I, and I went to school in the South. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, precisely. But again, it's like it's wanting people people wanting to distance themselves from that ugly history. Yeah, but That's without doing the repair and the healing. No, so the without, problem is like, of course, people like y- you cannot. You cannot distance yourself from the wound while all the festering bacteria is still sitting in it. Yeah. Oh, no, of course. Yeah. Which is, what's, which is what people, I think, have been attempting to do. And for themselves, like, oh, it, and, and it goes along lines like, you know, oh, I have a black friend to, you know, you know, I, I donate to the NAACP to, yeah. I march on the streets. And those are various different ways of, 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 of feeling allied without necessarily always giving up privilege or giving up things exactly so then yeah Yeah. so then that's kind of where i feel like where i wanted to come from and we'll wrap up a little bit because i know like guys i always talk for a long time so we We could (laughs) talk forever we could talk forever um but like that kind of is where i wanted to go this this month with things which is to, to kind of start sussing out like what is it that we can do to go from like you know, okay, I'm patting myself on the back for, like, writing a supportive Facebook post. Or, yeah. like, you know... Which we appreciate. Just, yeah, like, not not that that counts yes. for nothing. Just, but like, there's more. is there a, a measurable difference you can be making? And yes, and how? And what are the steps yeah. to get yourself to that place? And certainly educating yourself is the first step. I mean, yeah, yeah and leads to the rest of that. Um, but that's kind of... that's That's really... I don't, I don't, I mean. Well, and like, I think fighting for programs, like people get down on affirmative action or like the ideas around that, but the reality is people are starting from a different um, place. Like, this thing, mm-hmm. like we don't have, like a lot of black families don't have generational wealth. They don't have mm-hmm. generational education. Like, so like people who are saying, well, I got here by my boost. Nah, like, no, no you, you could get loans more easily. Even in the, like your parents could get loans more easily. Like there's, there's more that you were able to build up from. And that's not just the mentality and the thinking that's in there because there's also energetic things that we have to move through. Mm-hmm. But like, there's like concrete, substantial stuff to be to be moved through. Same thing with like education, college, like all those things. Having money's available. The, those sorts of things are like concrete things. There's there's scholarships you can give to mm-hmm. that actually go directly to traditionally underrepresented groups. There's there's community organizations that specifically help. There's 
well, and I don't know what this would look I honestly don't know what this would look like, but I saw a post the other day that I thought was really interesting. There was like, um, there was a woman who was coming in for a job, I think it's a graphic designer for a company, and the man, she gave her quote, and the person said, how about we up that to this, which is equivalent with what we paid the last man who did a similar job for the same work. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it deliberately did that, you know what I'm saying? Or like, and, and, and because it's been so imbalanced for so long, it needs to be stuff like that. Like, Ava DuVernay is like, on her show, is only having women directors, period. And she's like, for all seasons, she's like, it's just what I'm doing. She's like, Game of Thrones has had all men for every season. She's like, I'm just going to have all women. Yeah. Like, you can do that. You can say, I want everybody to be black. Well, and, 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 and good. And the thing is, it's not picking people who are less. And there are so many skilled workers in literally every field of every, of every race, every color, every denomination, every moniker you could put on anybody. There are people who are skilled and magnificent at what they do that will give you insight and by having them in the room it it opens up so much that actually makes your business better makes your business better it, it and sometimes can make your life better and for sure makes your community better like be like that's what I want we need to find I, I want to hire you know people I want to deliberately support these communities that are traditionally underrepresented yeah absolutely and yeah. it's I mean I, I, I and people going into like devil's advocate about that drives me nuts. <laughs> but and people like, do because they're like everybody should be equal except for that we're not. But they, except that we're not. We didn't, we didn't start out equal. There's there's way more opportunities. And the thing is, a lot of times, people in those traditionally underrepresented groups are not given opportunities at the same rate that that white men are or white women, but for sure white men. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like we just we just we just aren't. Not to mention that like. Privilege on the whole is just embedded so hard in things. It's even, systemic. It, yeah, and even, <laughs> like, I don't know. I think being an actor is an interesting Girl. view into a lot of this. Girl. Because you come up against job after job that is not given to the most talented person. Oh, it's yes. over and over and over again. And you see how, like... <laughs> why the idea that like oh why just why can't we all just be treated equal and the best person get the job because it never has been that way because it never has yeah. even beyond race like even yeah. if they're just like this is only going to be white people guess what the best white person isn't probably going to get that acting job like because yeah. because there are other things at play there, there are other factors. privileges at play yeah. there are connections there's nepotism there's all mm-hmm. the money coming from somebody wants something someone likes the way that person looks like things are not unfortunately decided on who is mm-hmm. the best. So like, yes, we need to broaden our scope that way and not pretend that like suddenly we can make a, a, a world in which we're all mm-hmm. just getting picked for our talent. Yeah. You know, like the pool needs to be a lot wider. Yeah, and I think everybody can't take on, you can't take on everything. You can take your baby steps and then try and do your baby steps until, and then remember when you're in positions of power that you have an opportunity. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's the thing. Yes. It's like you have, you, in positions of power, you have an opportunity. In positions of access, you have an opportunity. If you're able to be in a room that somebody else isn't in, if you look around and you realize that you're a white person in a room of all other white people, um, you have an opportunity Yeah. to say something, to change things, to create something different, to advocate for something different, to call it, call it out. Yeah, and also to know that, like, the discomfort in that moment is okay. Like that's part of it. It's just to mm-hmm. know that that's not going to be comfortable, mm-hmm. but that ultimately that discomfort is fleeting, <laughs> yeah. and like the rewards of allowing that discomfort and having that difficult conversation with other white people that might not agree with you uh, are going to be far greater than mm-hmm. whatever little discomfort you're feeling in in that time. And yeah. like, I mean, I don't know. Anyway. So I know we gotta wrap up. Yes. But thank you so much. Oh, oh you're, you're just the best. Thank you. Oh. Isn't she wonderful and beautiful? <laughs> thank you guys thank for you. listening, and that's reflections. But mm. thank you for listening and being open. Thank you guys. See you next week. Bye.